Today we want to deal with Lesson 6, the Bronze Age. And in this lesson, what we want to do is to take a look at some of the Egyptian history that we are aware of, and then some of the problems encountered in trying to look at the Exodus and its uh, movement from Egypt to Mount Sinai. The pharaohs of the 19th dynasty moved the capital to the north. This means that it was moved into the Delta area. And Tanis was the city chosen. And the pharaohs took city type names. We have Sidi the first, we have Sidi the second. This is in the tradition of the Hyksos. The Hyksos ruled Egypt from 1730 to 1330 when the pharaohs at this time had a celebration of the 400th year anniversary of the Siti god. A Siti was a god of the Hyksos and it was taken over by the Egyptians and they celebrated the 400th anniversary of his being worshipped by the Egyptians. There were many contacts between the powers in Mesopotamia and Egypt throughout the ages. Matani's power gradually declined and Shunashura, king of Kizuwatna, made a treaty with Hatti and moved into Syria. This means that you have two powers in the north coming together and they are moving south then into the area that we would call the Holy Land. Shutarna, the son of Aratarna, strengthened his ties with Egypt by sending his daughter, Kelly Hepa, to Amenhotep III as a wife. Shatarna also sent the statue of Ishtar for the pharaoh's health. We don't know what the pharaoh was suffering from. We just know that he had asked for the statue of Ishtar to be sent, that it would heal him. Tushrata succeeded his father and sent his daughter to join her sister in the pharaoh's harem. Changes in Mitanni resulted in a threat to Egyptian interests in Canaan. The rise of Subiluliuma saw the capture of New Gish and Aleppo in North Syria. Subiluliuma offered an alliance to Egypt with Thutmose IV, and in many respects this was the Golden Age of Egyptian history. Canaan was in the hands of the Egyptians and there was peace with Mitanni in the north. But all this came to a dismal end under Amenhotep IV, whose 17-year reign ended in chaos at home and in the Levant. The correspondence between Amenhotep III and Kajman Enlil had mainly to do with negotiations for a royal wedding. Amenhotep IV would get a wife and Tushrata would get gold. But things did not go well. Texts in the Amarna letters indicate trouble in Byblos for the pharaoh with Amuru and the Hittites. A new element coming into the picture are the Apiru. This was a landless people often equated with the Hebrews. The two cannot be connected since the, they came from different roots, but they do have much in common. Ramses I served as a military commander under Horemheb. He was very old by the time he became pharaoh. 
the son of Ramses I, Seti I, was a military commander and was well suited to begin the reconquest of the southern Levant. Seti I is usually dated around 1318 to 1301. He campaigned in the first year of his reign. He has records with both victory stela and with reliefs. His victory stela was erected at the scenes of victories in Beit Shan and Tel Es Shebab. The reliefs are mainly in the Temple of Amman at Karnak, and they depict his victories. He has a battle with the Shashu. The Shashu were a nomadic people who lived on the sand. Then he also shows men felling trees for Pharaoh as the town of Kader in the land of Nim, whose rulers are the great princes of Lebanon. He also shows the conquest of Yenoam, and here he mentions the Apiru. The conquest of a town called the town of Canaan. And then there are topographical lists that he also has. In the outline of his campaign, it looks like he began along the Via Maris, as most of the Egyptian campaigns did, from Sila to Raphia and Gaza. He directed primarily against the Phoenician coast of Akko, Uzu, Tyre, and the area of Gamad. In Ezekiel 27:11, the men of Gamad are mentioned. Certain units direct to the Jezreel Valley to Beit Shan area and then northward to Yenoam, Hatzor, Kadesh, and again he encountered the Shashu. The town before Hatzor was Kiriab Anab in Bashan according to Anastasi 1. Note the victory stela found at Tel Esh Shebab in the Yarmuk Valley, about 25 miles from Yanoam. He also had subsequent campaigns farther north. Then we have Ramses II, 1299 to 1232. He had a clash with the Hatti at Kadesh. The battle was a draw. This is where the Hittites drew him into a trap. He didn't realize this, and he fought valiantly, and only because of his ability was he able to escape at all and made his way back to Egypt. He described the battle as a great victory for the Egyptians, but we know from the Hittite account that he was lucky to escape with his life. In his 27th year, a peace treaty was made with Hatti, recognizing the status quo in the Levant. Good sources for this period, you'll find in K.A. Kitchener, some new light on the Asiatic Wars of Ramses II, in the Journal of Egyptian Archaeology, Volume 50, 1964, pages 47 to 70, and also A. H. Gardner, The Ancient Military Road Between Egypt and Palestine, in the Journal of Egyptian Archaeology, 1920, pages 99 to 116. Now, the land of Canaan is described in the Papyrus Anastasi 1. And the biblical description in Numbers 34, 1 through 12, and Joshua 13, 1 and 2, fits the district which the Egyptians had organized into a province called Pahati Sa Kanahi.
The, the description does not fit any of the other time periods. In the time of David, the time of Solomon, or of Jeroboam II. Those were times when the Israelites ruled over all of the territory that God had promised to Abraham. Now I'd like to discuss elements that have to do with the exodus and the desert wandering and show you the difficulty that we have in trying to piece this material together. First of all, the exodus and the desert wandering. There is evidence for Israelite conquest in the 13th century, according to Aharoni. Now, the early date of the conquest would be in the 15th century, 1446, and the 13th century would be in the 1200s. We know that Ramses is mentioned in Exodus 1.11, and the Merneftah Stila, dated to 1220, mentions Israelites as a people and that they were conquered by Merneftah. The archaeological survey in southern Transjordan indicates that settlement was renewed only at the beginning of the 13th century. So archaeological evidence seems to be for the late date of the Exodus. And then we have that story of, the, of Ramses at Kadesh in 1286, which was a defeat of the Egyptians. Then we have several factors involved in the date of the Exodus, and these are incidents listed by William Lasor. We have the foundation of Solomon's Temple about 960, the 400 80 years of 1 Kings 6, 1, and 440 years in the Septuagint. It says that they were in Egypt 430 years in Exodus 12, 40, but the Samaritan text has in Canaan and Egypt. The Septuagint has in Egypt and Canaan. There's the 400 years of Genesis 15:13 and the four generations of Genesis 15, 16, Abraham says that his descendants will be slaves in Egypt for 400 years. And then he says, and in the fourth generation, they will come out of Egypt. Well, the only 100-year generation that we have is from Abraham to Isaac. From the covenant of Abraham to the giving of the law, according to Galatians 3.17, is 430 years. And then in Judges 11.26, says they would be the side of the Arnon, 300 years. Septuagint and the Vulgate have by the side of the Jordan. In Acts 13, 19 to 20, Stephen says in his sermon, they were in Egypt 450 years, but there is a textual problem in the Greek. The first city taken by the Israelites was Jericho, and in the excavation at Jericho, Garstein dated that to 1400 B.C. Vincent came along, and he dated it to 1250. And then Kathleen Kenyon came along, and she dated it to 1600 BC. Then we have the destruction of Kiryat Sefer and Lachish, dated to 1230 by archeological data. And Joseph was in Egypt, most likely in the Hyksos period, 1730 to 1570. Yes, the Amarna letters reflect more of the conquest as we see it in the scripture. And the name of Ramses suits the Ramesside 
dynasty. The Merneftah's victory stela about 1229 records the victory over Israel. Now we have some other chronology that we have to deal with. Abraham was 100 at Isaac's birth. Isaac is 60 at Jacob's birth. Jacob is 60 at Joseph's birth. Joseph was 17 when he was taken to Egypt. He was 30 when he entered the service of Pharaoh. And there were seven years of plenty and then two years of famine according to Genesis 45, 6. When Jacob went to Egypt, Joseph was 39 or 40. Jacob is 130 at his descent to Egypt. Jacob told Pharaoh that he was 130 years of age. According to this, Jacob would be 90 years older than Joseph. And then we are told that there are 720 years from Abraham to the Exodus. 1,200 years from Abraham to Solomon. And then we are told in Exodus 6, 16 to 20, that there was four generations from the tribe of Levi Levi, Kohath, Amram, and Moses. So in the fourth generation, they left Egypt. Now, how about the root of the Exodus? This is a difficulty. From Bitter Lake is a well called by the Arabs Mara because of the sulfur in the water, according to Harel. Elam, near the Suez, there are 12 wells and a palm grove. That in the desert of Sin, manna and quail were provided. In Rephidim, there was no water, and Moses struck the rock and water came out. But this is also where you had the battle with the Amalekites. In the desert of Sinai and Mount Sinai, Harel says this is near Elam, and a mountain is called Sin Bisher. Sin is tooth, and Bisher is lawbringer. The height is only 617 meters. It's not too high, but prominent on the landscape. It is a very imposing sight as you look at it. Surrounding it are water sources and pasture land. From Goshen to Sinai is three days' journey. And through the valley is the main route to the Gulf of Elot, 76 kilometers. But it never has snow. And the word hor in Hebrew means uh, dry. 11 days' journey from Horeb to Kadesh Barnea. Then there's the desert of Paran. Three days' journey to Taberah in Numbers 11.3. And next was Kirbarot Hata'aba and Hazarot. Then Kadesh Barnea. In Numbers 33, it lists 45 stations and settlements in the way from Ramses to the plain of Masab. So this is one of the reasons why they did not take the way of the Philistines. It was just too heavily guarded by Egyptian troops and the number of fortresses there. Now how about routes? Well, there's the way of the Philistines, the Via Maris, and there are at least 12 fortresses located on this route, which is the shortest way to Canaan. And then there is Goshen, to Beersheba, which is called the Way of Sur. Then there's the Way of Atharim. The Amalekites and Canaanites defeated them there. And the Way of the Desert, this is the main route connecting the Gulf of Suez to the Gulf of Aqaba. 
and this is now the Hajj route, the pilgrim route. There's also the difficulty of the Reed Sea. It seems to be close to the Mediterranean Sea near Gaza, or it's close to the Mediterranean on the bay of the port of Said. There are two bays, and both bays have been suggested as the Reed Sea. It's close to Ismailia, the Lake Timsa. It could be the large Bitter Lake or the small Bitter Lake or the Gulf of Elat or the Gulf of Suez. Between the large and small Bitter Lakes is Yam Suf, the Reed Sea. The reeds can only grow in fresh water. This rules out all those connected with the sea. This is Harrell's view. Before the Suez Canal, the water in this area was three to four feet deep, and this was a ford. On the night of the crossing, there was an east-southeast wind. The Egyptian climatic atlas gives the prevailing wind from the northwest to the southeast. The wind pushed the water to the western lake then when the wind stopped, the water returned to normal. The canal from the Nile to the Suez was built by Sidi in the 15th century BC. But the biblical account seems to indicate that the Israelites went through the sea with water on both sides. That has to be taken into consideration. Aharoni looks for the Reed Sea in the northern delta and says they contained sweet water in antiquity and papyrus reeds grew in this vicinity. Perhaps it was the Gulf of Serbonitas which separated Migdal from Baal Zephon. How about Mount Sinai? This is a difficult problem. There's no continuation of tradition for the present Mount Sinai. Most scholars came from Europe and the U.S. In the summer, the climate is hot and dry, and a short time is not sufficient to survey the Sinai. And this is the view of Har El, that most scholars did not know Arabic. The guides were the sheikhs of the tribes. You need the acquaintance with shepherds' life and Harel claims that he is a shepherd. And to trace the route, one needs to be familiar with the geography of the area. Biblical scholarship is not enough. He spent two months in Sinai in 1957, and after 67, he spent more time. The material of the last 200 years locates the Reed Sea in nine different places. Mount Sinai is located in 12 places. Now with Harel, 13. And Anadi believes it is Saudi Arabia. What about the geography of the area? Sinai can be divided into three main parts. The north, the central plateau, and the southern mountains. In southern Sinai, lack of water, according to the Bible, but here's plenty of water. Mount Sinai, or Horeb, means dry, very far from the land of Goshen. A day's journey was about 25 kilometers. Mount Moses, or Jebel Musa, was named after a Christian Arab priest in the fourth century AD. Josephus wrote that Mount Sinai is among the highest of the Sinai, but the area around is very rich pasture land. Aharoni supports this area. Although the alternation of the names Sinai and Horeb raises a problem, it is clear that already in the biblical period they sought the mountain of God in the southern Sinai Peninsula among the lofty granite mountains in the vicinity 
of Pharaoh Paran. How about the land of Midian? The distance from Goshen is 450 kilometers. The only site in the surrounding area that has basalt rocks and fire should come from volcano. And then in central Sinai, this is the most desolate area of Sinai. Climate is hot in summer, it's cold in winter. There's no vegetation here. The main roads do not cross. Steep slopes on the west, the south, and the east. It's even difficult for the Bedouin to live here. And then in the northern Sinai, the highest mountains in the Middle East are in the northern part, 2,600 meters. Slopes are very steep. Erosion is great. It is a comfortable place because of the high mountains and mild climate. Lots of water sources, springs on the lower part of the mountains. It's close to the Mediterranean Sea. The sand dunes are the best reservoir for water. There's 60,000 square kilometers, but only 2,000 kilometers of fine soil, and 1,500 are in the northern part. So you see that all of these have problems, and if a person is going to try to work their way through them, you have many difficulties. Now we've talked about the Egyptian activity in the Holy Land and you notice that there was a lot of activity but uh, there is no sign of this or hint in the biblical account. But we need to keep in mind that the Egyptians were in Canaan about the time that the Exodus happened in Egypt if we are dealing with the early exodus. So we need to keep all of these things in mind and it is very difficult to bring them all together.